my intuition Blocked by every Christian Every God-fearing nation Holidays for funerals Quiet like Alvation I got no family with friends Fissured by our preference Violence has its prevalence Quiet through this violence Baby, I'm a corner Baby, I'm a corner Maybe I'm a corner Maybe yeah, it's over Ruptured my Achilles Baby, don't you feel me? Everyone's a villain Stranger in my city Popping over fences Baby, keep me danger Attention's now arrested Murdering a stranger I got four years Stubborn, racist, elated Fruits of peaceful Marxist, alcoholic Baby, I'm your tonic Baby, I'm a corner Hello, everyone. 
everyone. My name is Alleluia Panis, Director of Cool Arts. Welcome and thank you for joining the Asian American Musicians Advocating for Social Justice and Racial Equity panel. Uh, for those who have joined us, we encourage you to use the chat function to express your appreciation or ask any questions you might have uh, for our panelists. Um, we will also be recording this webinar and posting on our social media, so you may refer back to the session in the future. This event is presented by Cool Arts and API Cultural Center of San Francisco. Welcome. Art stands in solidarity with all of California's indigenous people. We acknowledge that our work takes place in the now occupied traditional lands of the Olone, Yelamu, Chochenyo, Ramatush, and Mumuwekma people who are the past, present, and future stewards of this place. I'd like to welcome John Carlos Perea. Associate Professor of American Indian Studies in the College of Ethnic Studies at the San Francisco State University, who will honor us with his performance of Memorial Song. Wow. Thank you, John Carlos. That was powerful indeed. Phew. So here we are. Uh, the pandemic has impacted us all, all of us, all our lives. And oh, I'm so ready for COVID and 2020 to be over, aren't you? Um, so also like for us in the field, the arts field, all our all in-person events have been shut down since March, but it's also provided us this time for this online conversation to happen. I would doubt that a lot of the uh, panelists that are with us gonna be with us today um, would be at home, um, but rather probably gigging. So uh, thank you for, um, for being here. Um, this event was actually inspired by um, the work of my good friend, Francis Wong, um, a longtime Cool Arts board member, co-founder and creative director of Asian Improv Arts, saxophonist extraordinaire, you know, educator, mentor, and activista since day one. 
Um, thank you, Francis, for giving us this idea. So I'm so, so excited for our panel of music makers and looking forward to a meaningful and much needed discussion. So before that, I would like to introduce uh, Vinay Patel, the executive director of API Culture Center and Asian Improv Arts. Vinay? Hello, uh, I wanna thank uh, Alleluia and Cool Arts uh, for producing and presenting this show and also wanna thank John Carlos Barea for um, that very moving opening. Um, it's my honor to introduce Kevin Falez. Uh, he is Associate Professor of Music at Columbia University, where he shares a joint appointment in African American and African Diaspora Studies. His book titled Birds of Fire, Jazz, Rock, Funk, and the Creation of Fusion uh, was published by Duke University Press in 2011. It's a study of fusion music of the 1970s and was awarded the 2012 Woody Guthrie Book Award. Without further ado, Kevin Falez. Hello, um, thank you for that introduction. Good evening or afternoon or morning, uh, wherever you're at. Um, I want to acknowledge that I am speaking from the occupied lands of the Lenape people here in Manhattan or, or Manhattan, New York, um, and it's evening here. Uh, before we begin the discussion, I want to thank Alleluia Panis Cool Arts and the Asian Pacific Islander Cultural Center in San Francisco for organizing this extraordinary event. I also want to thank each of the phenomenal artists assembled here for the discussion tonight as well as to everyone who's joining us for this important conversation. And I feel privileged to be a small part of this event. As the title to tonight's discussion suggests, the artists gathered here share an interest in linking their music to broader social issues. And we wanna focus on the ways in which their sense of being Asian American influences their musical and political positioning. At this particular moment, when anti-Asian racism has seen an alarming uptick. Their music signifies on a long history of Asian American resistance to racism. This includes a long history of Asian American musicians, such as those we just honored in memoriam, as well as those such as Nobuko Miyamoto, Charlie Chen, the members of Yokohama, California, and Hiroshima, whose early collaboration with Teatro Campesino speaks to the cross-cultural moves made by Asian American artists as well as Anthony Brown's Asian American Orchestra and his early work in the Ensemble United Front. Asian American musicians' his music does a lot more than just political work, of course. And it is in that intersection of aesthetics and politics in which artistic goals and political aims converge that we hope to think through the present moment. Each of these artists has contributed much to making audible the rich musical history Asian Americans can claim and the powerful responses Asian Americans have tendered toward the racism and social inequities they have confronted ever since the first Filipino sailors arrived in North America in the late 16th century. In other words, Asian Americans have been here for over 400 years, enriching as well as challenging US American norms with their creative contributions. But I don't mean to lock our conversation in the present since the past and the future both share in making the contemporary moment. What does an Asian American musical heritage sound like? What do these artists hope to pass on? We have the great fortune of having an intergenerational group of Asian American musicians with distinct personal histories. And I mean to include each of their families as histories of immigration and diasporic movement across geographies, cultures, and temporalities, as well as distinct aesthetics, which are drawn from a diverse array of influences including at times their own Asian heritages to create music that articulates their relationship between music and social advocacy. Their conversation should provide us with a rich set of possibilities and perhaps even problematics for us to contemplate together this evening. Speaking of this evening, the program will proceed as follows. After a brief introduction, 
and more info regarding these artists is available on their websites. Um, each of the musicians will discuss their work and the ways in which social in issues impact their creativity. After everyone has had a chance to speak, I have a couple of discussion prompts for which I'll ask the artists to respond. Then I will open up for questions and comments from the audience. Uh, please type your questions and comments in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, I'm aware that some attendees have already sent in questions which we'll prioritize. So without taking any more of your time and without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Erica Oba. Erica Oba is a composer, pianist, flutist, and educator based in the San Francisco Bay Area. She has composed for big bands, small jazz ensembles, chamber groups, dance and theater, and is active as a performer in a wide variety of ensembles and multidisciplinary collaborations. Here's Erica. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Erica Oba. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, and thank you so much to Cool Arts for inviting me today. I'm really honored to be part of this conversation. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that kind of integrating our larger political goals with our creative practice is um, it's a complex multi-tiered process. Um, so for me, I've been thinking about this um, on multiple levels. So on one level, there's the thematic conceptual material. And uh, like Kevin was saying, sometimes that's drawing on our heritage in some ways to kind of center our identities in that way. Um, in addition to that, there's the aesthetic materials, uh, which can mean a lot of things as well. Um, and then outside of that, of course, there's all the kind of extra musical choices we have to make and our choice of collaborators, our creation choices, um, the setting of our performances and uh, the audiences we're trying to connect with, um, and also how to gather and redistribute all the resources we generate as uh, artistic creators. And of course, Asian Improv Arts has been doing so much of that work for, for decades and uh, I've been really inspired by everything that John and Francis continue to do. Um, so uh, in that spirit, I just wanted to talk about a couple projects that I have going on um, and how I'm working on kind of integrating all of my sort of larger social justice goals with my creative work. So uh, one of my recent projects is a multi-movement suite of music called Strange Moon that I wrote for my band and to meet Catastrophe Jazz Ensemble. Um, and I believe there's a photo that might pop up. Um, here we go. <laughs> um, so uh, that's my band, Rice Kings. My other band, Ends Meet Catastrophe Jazz Ensemble, um, is the one that did this project, Strange Moon. There it is, yeah. Um, uh, so this is a project that I worked on for a couple of years. Um, it's a four movement piece of work that I kind of framed as a ritual piece that is drawing on Japanese folklore very loosely about um, a folk tale about celestial visitors from the moon. And I sort of added in um, an explicitly queer love story of my own creation on top of it. Um, and um, it was a choice I wanted to make because um, I, wanted to experiment a little bit with how to really center that facet of my identity in my creative work. And in this particular band, three out of the four members are queer. So it felt appropriate and apt and I wanted to kind of celebrate that part of ourselves through this piece. Um, so my other band that uh, you previously saw a second ago, Rice Kings, <laughs> is a duo project I have with Eli Maliwan, uh, pictured here with his Iwi. Um, so the two of us created this project um, explicit, explicitly to center our identities as queer Asian musicians, uh, just because there weren't that many of us that we were able to connect with. So we wanted to make a band where that was um, explicitly our goal to center that. Um, and through that band, we've had the opportunity to connect with a lot of the um, kind of queer art scene in the Bay Area, uh, which is vast and uh, wonderful. 
and uh, we've been able to really connect with a lot of people outside of the jazz scene. So including, you know, punk musicians and uh, performance artists and indie songwriters and um, there's this really wonderful network of kind of DIY art making um, and it's been a, a great opportunity to see kind of all the practical ways you can really build a kind of DIY network of uh, artists supporting and promoting each other. Um, so I want to be mindful of the time I have. I know I only have three minutes. Um, I also wanted to talk about the work I do uh, right now for the composer Gabriella Lina Frank. Um, she's my mentor and hero. And uh, she runs the Composers Academy for um, to support emerging composers, often composers who don't traditionally have institutional support. And uh, through my work with her, I'm just learning all of the ways um, uh, that composers and artists can really be art citizens and um, all the practical ways that you can create tangible support for one another. Um, and a lot of the work is in fact extra musical. There's uh, all the kind of unglamorous grunt work that goes into networking and grant writing and curation and scheduling and, uh, and all, of, all of those skills that um, I'm finding to be very, very valuable and instrumental in really creating substantial movements to support each other and give voice where uh, they might normally have been marginalized and uh, create partnerships of mutual support. Um, so yeah, so those are some of my goals are to kind of keep working on those skills so that I can help organize and support the people around me. All right, thank you, Erica. Um, our next speaker is Francis Wong, a longtime community activist and musician with roots in the Asian American consciousness movement of the 1970s. And as Alleluia pointed out, the catalyst for this evening. Francis. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? Um, actually, I, I asked them to um, show um, John, the spotlight John too, John Jang here. But yeah, there he is. And so that's John Jang. Oh, yeah, that's John Jang. Got the name card, Francis Wong. See, back in the day, the funders used to confuse John and me. They used to, they used to call me John and used to call him. But then... Um, well, what's so great today is that there's so many of us that hopefully there's not just two, you know, because when um, we're actually, John and I are celebrating a 40th anniversary of a meeting together, because um, when I was in school um, at Stanford, um, some uh, uh, some friends of mine, Nancy Hatamiya, actually organized a Asian American musicians workshop um, on campus without telling me. And then they put an announcement in the newspaper. And then so I said, whoa, oh, I better go to that. And so I went to that and I didn't know what to expect, but actually only one, one other person showed up. And that, that other person was John Yang over there. <laughs> And so um, I, I think I'll never complain about how many people show up to a gig or to a meeting or anything because that person, even if it's one person, could change your life. And I, and I, I just want to acknowledge and honor that uh, in some ways us meeting together today is part of the continuing rit ritual over the past 40 years. Hey, John, what do you want to say? Well, I kind of want to talk about what you said earlier. Um, so when we were in New York, we were handed per diem envelopes, but I was handed Francis Wong's <laughs> envelope and Francis handed John Jang. And then there were a number of black composers at this uh, meeting. And so um, 
they would remark, the Asians are very organized. It was just Francis and me. You know, <laughs> it's very easy to organize just two people. Um, but uh, yeah, those are the kinds of experiences we both shared and uh, we'll both remember. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't have done this by myself. Uh, I think what if there was no Francis Wong, I don't know what I, who I would, would have become. Well, thank you, John. Thank you for all these years. Um, I just wanted to say it's, you know, it's amazing that we've had, you know, that we really have an expansive field and there's so many different kinds of work going on and so many ways people, we're all stepping up uh, to create change, you know, using all our creativity and drive. And I just want to just say, uh, make a quick point about what I think my work has been, you know, a, and that it's a broader vision of music making. Sometimes we think music making is just the actual playing the instruments or singing or whatever, but um, it's a whole range of activity. And I really liked what uh, Erica said about all the things, you know, that we have to do that's extra. <laughs> and and I, I, I like to think of that, all the work that we've, um, that I've been a part of has um, kind of uh, adds up to what folks today are calling holding space. And that, you know, in all, the, all, all this time, just try, trying to be part of holding space for community, holding space for creativity, holding space for those who are committing to justice and equity, holding justice for those who are only learning about it and those who have also shown us the way. Um, it was great to see uh, the Jay's piece about Amiri Baraka because uh, um, actually Amiri Baraka was like the third person in the meeting between me and John because that was mainly what we talked about. So um, I think that's it. That's all I have to say, you know, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Francis and John. Um, our, our next speaker is Jen Xu, uh, Guggenheim Fellow, USA Fellow, Doris Duke Artist, and multilingual vocalist, composer, multi-instrumentalist dancer. Xu was the first female and vocalist band leader on Pi Recordings and has produced seven albums, performed at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, and the National Theater of Korea, among others, and is a Fulbright scholar who speaks 10 languages. Before the pandemic, she was touring her solo work, Zero Grasses, commissioned by John Zorn, and giving free workshops in schools and for families across 50 states, and has since moved her teaching and projects to Patreon, where she hosts global workshops and salons on Zoom. She co-founded Mutual Mentorship for Musicians with Sarah Serpa to empower and elevate underrepresented musicians around the world. Welcome, Jen. Yay, hi, I turned my camera on a little early. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's such an honor and I was just crying and I will continue to cry throughout this um, time together. So don't be surprised. Um, I'm so moved and I just wanted to um, be, I wanted to thank John Carlos and uh, whom I miss very much uh, for that um, opening. Um, I wanted to just talk about, you know, being born in Peoria, Illinois. Um, I was raised in Dunlap, which is just a small village north of Peoria. And I met Francis and John um, just after graduating from Stanford in 2000. And that was after 22 years of denying that I was Asian. And, um, you know, I'd never met or seen uh, Asian American artists or women or women of color uh, performing their own music in my school, in the schools that I went to or on stages in Peoria. So it was like 22 years of making music and art while assimilating just to avoid racism um, and trying to be as non-Asian as possible. Uh, whether it was in classical, you know, Western classical music training or my forays into musical theater or, um, you know, finding freedom in 
expressing myself within Black American music. So Francis, Jenny Lim, John, Mia Masaoka, and Vijay, you know, they were some of the first Asian American artists that I had ever met in my life, <laughs> uh, creating their own work and their own path. And I'm going to get emotional, okay. Um, but the Asian improv arts community, you know, really encouraged me and for the first time in my life, you know, to really embrace my ancestry and to forge my own path. Um, so fast forward to this work, uh, which I wanted to share and maybe Eric can um, get it ready. Uh, but some expert, these are just some excerpts from a solo show that I produced called Nine Doors. And um, it come, it was inspired out of 15 years of um, research in Taiwan, Cuba, Brazil, East Timor, and on and on throughout Asia. And um, I toured this show um, in 2018 up until the pandemic lockdown. So uh, it was a 50 state tour that I focused on um, giving free creativity workshops in schools and in homes for families in small rural towns. That was my focus, you know, a town just like Dunlap uh, so that I could show up and be that performer for that little girl who was me in my school. So, um, so in this video, you'll hear um, many languages and instruments and just to save time, I'm going to paste them in the chat because I know everyone asks about those, but um, so it's, yeah, they were just, they're just tools that helped me tell the story. And this is about um, a Javanese friend who was killed in a car crash. Um, and I weaved it together with two woman warrior stories. So it's a very feminist story. So we'll just have a look. <laughs> And she beats her drum as they sail away, singing. Bibi the cup and I, Bibi the cup and I, oh, they fade away that holic money on the line at Denny. Drum up an eye, drum up an eye. A woman tricked a man and he did not know it. Bibi the cup and I. Yay. So um, I, I wanted to just kind of jump uh, into the next um, screenshots and, uh, you know, after or even during, you know, finding your own voice, it's, you know, how can I elevate other voices um, who are also underrepresented, uh, underrepresented in our world? Um, and so 
I'm going to paste this link um, and I'll talk about it more later. I just wanted to give you a look at the website and this is a mutual mentorship initiative uh, with which I co-founded with Sara Serpa, who's an amazing vocalist. And uh, in March, we started talking about, um, you know, how about a mutual mentorship paradigm, um, which we didn't really see a lot of. Um, and so I'll talk more in depth about it, but I just wanted to uh, share these pages. Um, and it's, it's just been so inspiring. And the mentorship, of course, um, from Francis and John and uh, Vijay and uh, everyone in the Asian improv community, you know, uh, without that foundation, I could not have even uh, thought about this. Um, so, yeah. So I hope that's, uh, we'll talk more <laughs> later on. So thank you. That was beautiful, Jen. Uh, thank you. Um, our next speaker is John Jang, whose trajectory of work mirrors the new American majority with the development of a unique Asian American perspective. This new perspective is in solidarity with the indigenous people and people of color that was inspired by the Black Liberation Movement of the 1960s and the Black Lives Matter in the present, to which John owes a debt. Welcome, John. Thank you for having me, Kevin, and everybody else. Um, we're going to listen to an excerpt of one of my works entitled, Why Did They Have to Shoot Him So Many Times? Uh, on December 2nd, 2015, Mario Woods, a 26-year-old black man, was shot and killed by four <coughs> San Francisco police officers. They were charged with no wrongdoing. Um, Mario was shot 20 times. Um, so, um, an activist from the uh, Justice for Mario Woods campaign gave a CD, CD recording of this work um, to uh, Mario Woods' mother. And after she heard the music, she cried. And so this excerpt that you're gonna listen to is for Mario Woods and his mother and the Mario Woods and their mothers before him, before them, and the Mario Woods and their mothers after them. Mario Woods. Jessica Williams Nelson, Sandra Bland, Tavia Rice, Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown,
Jesus. You going to say anything, John? Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. Great. Um, thank you, John. Uh, <clears throat> all this music, it's making me wish we were having uh, music with a little bit of talking on the side rather than talking with a little bit of music on, <laughs> on the side. Uh, our next speaker is Filipino American guitarist composer Carl Evangelista who ranks among a new wave of activist musicians pushing the traditions of jazz and experimental music into the 21st century. Welcome, Carl. Treasonous activity, I put you in a locker. Got an eye on you if sus, 200 pesos buys a fraud. I don't live in a palace. Don't live in a palace Fuck your money and our fathers Look you sideways if your power I'm a criminal Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, My name is Carl Evangelista uh, That song was a very unsubtle critique of the Duterte administration I feel um, an exceptional personal responsibility to speak to these issues as my aunt Miriam Defensor Santiago was a longtime Filipino public servant um, and a constitutional scholar. So she may or may not have had something to say about these considerations. Um, just for some context, uh, roughly over 10 years ago, uh, when I was writing my graduate thesis at Mills College, I journeyed out to London to interview the great Louis Moholo Moholo. And I asked him, uh, what he felt the rationale for his music was. And he said it was to free South Africa. Lewis is um, well known uh, for his longtime uh, work in anti-apartheid activism. He was exiled from South Africa for decades uh, before the, the fall of the apartheid regime. And I feel like those sensibilities and the general concept of music as a weapon of struggle have exceptional resonance at a time when immigrants are imperiled, um, black bodies are imperiled and we are still navigating questions of equity for women in the arts for members of the lgbtq plus community and so on as an asian as an asian american musician in the 21st century i feel like it is first and foremost my priority my priority to make music that emboldens marginalized communities and empowers endeavors of creative daring i know that sounds really highfalutin but um, again, for perspective, what have we been doing but, you know, kind of just sitting around here for months. I had this project called Apura, which translates in Tagalog roughly to very urgent, um, with uh, my friend, the great Francis Wong, UK pianist Alexander Hawkins, and um, the great drummer Andrew Cyril. Um, that's, that project has been rescheduled three times, hopefully not going on four. So um, these circumstances have led me to reevaluate my relationship um, to music as a method of um, commercial success and a method of, um, of personal gain. Um, Asian improv arts has helped to inculcate in me the tools to navigate those considerations. So um, an album that my band Grex recently released uh, called Everything You Said Was Wrong, I'm gonna put the link in the chat right now. Um, this album, uh, was years in the making and upon its release, oh, sorry, I'm gonna send that to everyone. That album was years in the making and it's um, upon its release, we decided to direct 100% of the proceeds to um, the ACLU um, and uh, my friend and um, uh, some, uh, some sometime mentor, uh, Milford Graves, who is at present ailing. We are on Friday running a festival, the fourth of um, four of what we call lockdown festivals that engage with artists in the Bay Area um, for the purposes of um, basically just keeping people active and collecting monies uh, for causes of consideration. So Friday's proceeds will be directed to Mr. Graves, um, to Black Organizing Project out in Oakland and Asian Improv Arts, which has done so much for me. Um, I feel as if um, I've been given so much. If you see me walking down the street, it's um, uh, not immediately evident. You know, some people assume I'm mixed. 
Um, I want to double down on the fact that I'm deeply proud of my Filipino American heritage and everything I do is meant to empower people like me and um, members of my communities to um, excel, to communicate and to help to better the world um, for others. Um, there's not much more I have to say about that issue. I'm going to put the link to the festival on Friday in this chat in case any of you guys want to check it out. I feel so privileged to be here um, in and among this company. So thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, I've actually been playing everything you said was wrong for the last couple of days, kind of on a constant loop. Um, so I encourage everyone to have picked it up yet. Our final speaker right now is a composer pianist, Vijaya Iyer, who was described by the New York Times as a, quote, social conscience, multimedia collaborator, system builder, rhapsodist, historical thinker, and multicultural gateway, end quote. A 2013 MacArthur Fellow, he has released two dozen albums composed for orchestras, soloists, theater, dance, and film, and collaborated with Amiri Varaka, Wadada Leo Smith, Carrie Mae Weems, Peju Cole, Pamela Z, Henry Threadgill, Jennifer Coase, Zakir Hussain, and many other artists across disciplines. He teaches at Harvard as well. Welcome to Jay. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I, at the very last minute, grabbed a bunch of photos off my hard drive and sent them to our kind hosts who are just gonna sort of scroll through them as I speak, um, hopefully to make this a little less tedious. So I'm just gonna read a prepared statement because I'm a nerd, I guess, or because I had too much to say and I didn't really know how to even um, thread the needle here. Uh, I speak to you from Muncie, Lenape and Wappinger lands on the island of Manhata, also known as Harlem. I'm so honored to be included on this event with all of you today. I arrived in the SF Bay Area in the early 90s as I was entering my 20s. I did not yet know at the time that music would become my life. It took the kindness, generosity, and affirmations of Black elder musicians like Robert Porter, Ed Kelly, Donald Bailey, E.W. Wainwright, George Lewis, Amiri Baraka, and Steve Coleman as well as friends and collaborators like Will Power, Mohammed Bilal, Liberty Elman, Imani Uzuri, Diarmas Boone, and Robert Henry Johnson, and Asian improv artists like Mia Masaoka, John Jang, Mark Izu, Anthony Brown, Hafez Mudirzadeh, Glenn Horiuchi, and of course, Francis Wong, to help me begin to make sense of the idea of being an Asian American in creative music to help me make that choice a reality. With Francis' encouragement, I released my first two albums on Asian improv, Memorophilia in 95 and Architectures in 98. When I moved to New York at the end of 98, I was determined to continue these practices into the 21st century. I've been able to collaborate with visionary Black creative artists like Baraka, Butch Morris, Roscoe Mitchell, Wadada Leo Smith, Amina Claudine Myers, George Lewis, Reggie Workman, Andrew Surreal, Oliver Lake, Henry Threadgill, Charles Tolliver, Ralph Peterson, Gary Thomas, Jerry Allen, Craig Taborn, Jason Moran, Yosvani Terry, Mike Ladd, Teju Cole, Pamela Z, Guillermo Brown, Casa Overall, Marcus Gilmore, Graham Haynes, Taishan Sori, Ambrose Akinusuri, Faye Victor, Terry Lynn Carrington, Haile Garima, Carrie Mae Weems, Greg Tate, Val Jonti, DJ Spooky, H. Prism, Patricia, and Paloma McGregor, and also with many, many fellow South Asian Americans like Rudresh Mahantapa, Ganavya Doreswami, Aruj Aftab, Rajana Swaminathan, Nitin Mitta, Sunny Jane, Sufala, Rafik Bhatia, Brez Abasi, Shazad Ismaili, Himanshu Suri, and the late great Prashant Bhargava and with many other artists of color, including Amir El-Safar, Hafez Modirzadeh, Linda Mehan O, oh, Ok Young Lee, the list goes on. It certainly hasn't all been smooth sailing, but today I'm considered 
what they call a success story with an international performing career, awards, composer commissions, and a tenured faculty position. I must acknowledge that I, an Indian American, have accumulated significant power through my work in a field of music created by Black American music makers. I've tried to acknowledge this tension at every turn. I've strived to make music with sensitivity, integrity, and honesty, to advance ethics of collaboration and community, and to use my power to create and support opportunities for Black people every chance I get. However, all along, my privilege has operated in such a way to allow me as a non-Black person of color to benefit from tokenism, to assuage white guilt with my presence, and even to become, to my dismay, a de facto spokesperson for Black culture. As a male Indian American born to a Hindu Brahmin family, I am an example of the most privileged kind of Asian American. But this is a pattern that many Asian Americans experience. We might show up thinking that we're part of a change, but then we very often become a mitigating or mediating presence, merely enabling the continued workings of white supremacy and anti-Blackness. Partly by, by virtue of this privilege, I've been granted certain opportunities to influence and shape predominantly white institutions. As 2016 artist in residence at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, as music director for the 2017 Ojai Music Festival, as composer in residence at Wigmore Hall in London, as artistic director of the Banff International Workshop in Jazz and Creative Music, and indeed as a professor in the Department of Music at Harvard University. What I've noticed is how resistant these institutions are to change. Even if we are able to do something significant in our time with, uh, in, in our interactions with these, these organizations, our curatorial impact is likely to vanish as soon as we do, and the institution will invariably revert to its prevailing white ways. So now at the end of a turbulent 2020, I ask myself and all of us in our ongoing work to examine our own privilege and to think about the most effective concrete steps we might take to continue fighting anti-Blackness, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and racial capitalism. And I want to say that grass, grassroots community-based organizations like Asian Improv and Cool Arts offer crucial examples of how to do that, how to build sustained progressive work across generations. After 25 years, I'm still learning from your example. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vijay. Um, bringing out a number of important ideas uh, regarding the sort of interracial, cross-racial relations um, that occur in your work and in, in a, a number of people's work here today. In fact, that raises um, the question for me. Um, and I think uh, the, I'm gonna sort of adjust the prompt I gave to you earlier, but I was going to first ask Jay, Carl, and Erica to speak um, to this one prompt I have. So I want to say that your presence as Asian American artists are revolutionary in itself. Right? Um, yet there are widespread ideas about Asian Americans that undercut, and Jay was just speaking on very articulately to this, um, that undercut the ways in which anti-Asian racism can even register for many people, right? Such as the model minority myth, the studious polymath, the successful professional. How does this impact your approach in composition, performance, or the ways in which you represent yourselves in your work in public? And I'll take it any order. <laughs> I think we're all really polite. <laughs> okay. I, I, uh, well, Vijay just sort of spoke to it. Um, so maybe I can hear from maybe Erica or Carl. Sure. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, Vijay, thank you for your words. That was really powerful. And um, yeah, I, I definitely think there's a lot that 
we need to, oh, sorry. Um, we all need to grapple with on, uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, and I, I do think that um, uh, Asian American artists are sometimes used in the way that Vijay was talking about to promote anti-Blackness and sort of maybe assuage some amount of white discomfort uh, and diversity initiatives can be actively harmful in, this, in that way. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, to speak to Kevin's prompt, um, I guess there, there's still a lot that gets projected onto us, right? Or to, to any given demographic um, and a lot of loaded assumptions that go along with being part of a given demographic. Um, so for me, I think the antidote to that kind of essentialism is specificity. So trying to be as specific as we can in our own stories and presenting ourselves as fully and complexly as, as we can. Um, and just being aware of our position in regards to um, the legacy of music we're a part of, um, for, for us jazz musicians, you know, acknowledging um, our lineage, um, our artistic lineage coming from Black artists. And I think continuing to, um, as much as we can, uh, support and promote and um, really center the Black artists in our community so that they don't get, uh, so that they get their due that they deserve. Um, and I think that um, kind of going back to my earlier point just about um, continuing to figure out ways like Asian Improv Arts does to kind of create um, kind of grassroots uh, networks of mutual support. Mm -hmm. so, those are my two cents on that. <laughs> Great, thanks, Erica. Carl, did you want to add to that in any way? Or? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, I had the great privilege uh, this past semester of teaching um, a course um, essentially on music and politics as part of race and resistance studies at San Francisco State University, shout out RRS. Um, and a question that, that came up early on, because um, I structured a lot of the course, interestingly, around the words of um, Amiri Baraka and um, the dynamics of early free jazz, I structured a lot of the course around, um, around questions of, you know, of black music in the mid-century, mid-20th century. And um, something that came up was the question of appropriation and how um, non-African American um, minority groups or marginalized cultures can participate in that tradition without really taking it over. Um, and uh, the conclusion I came to, and or I guess one of the conclusions that we came to collectively as a class was um, was the, the notion of alignment. Mm -hmm. Just because you're participating in a tradition doesn't mean you take it on um, as yours. It means that you are literally doing that. You're participating in the tradition um, and you are um, positing yourself as part of a lineage. So even as um, a Filipino American and an Asian American improviser, um, I acknowledge simultaneously my debt to people like Francis and John, who've been doing this for so very long, and also my alliance with people like Louis Mahola Mahola or uh, people I've studied under, like um, like Roscoe Mitchell or or Myra Melford, who have given me so much and so much in the way of tools to cope with this this sort of industry. So, um, when I hear questions of the model minority, I think of questions of, and issues regarding the concept of alignment because it doesn't reflect my reality. Um, the immigrant experience, especially in the 21st century, is deeply complex. And even though I'm, I'm Filipino, and again, from far away, I'm pretty light-skinned. I mean, I'm not, like, no one, no, one, no one can really tell what I am. Um, from far away, I seem like I'm doing fine, but I grew up in both, briefly, Manila and Panorama City, a suburb of the San Fernando Valley. Um, and we had our cars stolen out front. There was, uh, there was gun violence. You know, our neighbors were Mexican-American and Jamaican, you know. So, um... I see myself again as participating in a broader culture of struggle and marginalization. I don't let the idea the, that I somehow benefit 
um, by virtue of you know my appearance or by virtue of my ethnicity, although I do benefit in, in certain very serious ways, I don't let that define my actions. And I don't think we should let um, those phenomena define our actions as artists. Do you have anything to add today or? Um, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you both for those great insights. And um, like I said, like I wrote in the chat, I'm taking notes. Um, you know, I was just thinking about how, uh, well, there's a, you know, I've, I've been putting out, I put out a lot of albums. And so there's like a certain period of time that comes around in every cycle of an album release, which is like, oh yeah, it's that time of year when white men write about you, which is basically what it means to release an album. Um, I wish that weren't the case, but I can say that, you know, 90, I'm not exaggerating to say 99% of the people who've written about me have been white men. One of the exceptions was Amiri Baraka. He wrote about my first album. Um, and I realized, the, I remember when he died, I went back to that, to that review. And I realized that he's basically one of the only people to ever talk about my feelings as though like the fact that I might have them, you know, that, that I as an artist might be expressing them. Um, and so it's kind of about like, you know, there's the press, there's that whole, like the way that one is received or represented through that discourse. But then there's also the reality of what happens on the ground for us as artists with and among each other and with and among our audiences, you know, and that's a very different reality um, than what tends to stay in the archive. And that's why I'm, I'm mentioning all that is because it's sort of like there's what, there's the trace we leave in the archive and then there's what's actually happening, um, up, you know, in community, those intangible, um, ways that we affect and are affected by each other. And, and that to me is like where the real work is. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it's, I guess what I would say, just like what I have to keep reminding myself is that um, I'm not writing for the, I mean, I'm not making music for those critics, you know? I'm making music for all kinds of people and for all kinds of occasions. And that's, that's, that's the real work that we can do. You know, that's, um, it, it will outlast all those, uh, those statements about us. And, and that's, that's the real work. And it, it has a way of like propagating across time and space in a way that you can't even predict. Like um, I put up, the, I, I wasn't even watching the slides, but I think one of those slides was an album cover for, um, the uh, Veterans Dreams Project, holding it down. So there's a woman who was in that project with us who had been a drone pilot. She piloted planes over Iraq and Afghanistan from Las Vegas when she was in the Air Force. She was a black woman from Baltimore. And she had her own um, experience just through working with us and, and like basically telling her story on an album of kind of um, regrounding herself after that, what became a sort of traumatic, so a PTSD experience of being in virtual combat. Um, and so that's a different kind of impact than like, you know, getting a good review or something. It's actually like mattering to somebody in their life that in a way, and that's one person, but that's like a thousand good reviews, you know? So, anyway. Yeah, well, speaking to that, I'm going to go off script a little for a moment here. So, speaking to that mattering and when you raised uh, the feeling and all of you talked about connections in various ways. And I was reading on Carl's um, Bandcamp page a quote that you have of Luis Moholo Moholo, right, where who says, you don't have to love us we love you. 
right? And I think it speaks to the, the kinds of ideas you're talking about around that reaching across and, and, and also, well, love isn't often talked about very much in definitely in scholarship much, right? And so I'd like to sort of maybe insert it into our conversation tonight a bit and ask sort of what role love plays in your music and you know the significance of having that that quote on your your webpage, Carl. Or and if anybody, of course, wants to um, jump in on, on that, but sort of yeah, the, the sort of role and function of love, if you will. I, I feel compelled to respond specifically to this, and so I, I want to articulate this um, very cleanly because I think it's an, it's instructive on how the nature of free improvisation. I know that this meeting isn't on free improvisation per se, but I think it's something that's probably a part of a lot of our distinct artistic praxis. Um, it's it's part of those. Um, but uh, when I first met Lewis again, it was like a decade or so ago. He started talking to me about sacrificial slaying of chickens. Um, and it's clear, it's not something that I do in my personal life, but Lewis did, he said to me, um, oh, you totally understand, right? You can relate, you're Filipino. And just that simple gesture of just kind of like hand across the aisle, like vis-a-vis -vis the third world actually meant a lot to me. And um, the guy has always been um, one of my heroes because I've been a longtime fan of the Brotherhood of Breath and the Blue Notes. Um, and so I went to go work with him in 2018 out in Europe with the great Trevor Watts and Alexander Hawkins. And one of the things that I immediately noticed about the process, and this is something I've heard echoes, echoed in interviews of Lewis over the years, is that when you're sitting down to free improvise, um, a lot of times it's a, it's a form of communication between distinct um, people and distinct identities. And there's no bias. You know, he says, I can play with a Japanese person, I can play with an American person, I can play with a Filipino person. But when we're sitting down to play, you know, um, the music is inevitably coded by our personal experiences, but at the same time, we're trying to communicate as people. And I, I think there's something really elegant about that. And so while he's attempting to communicate his me message, and did for several decades regarding um, uh, his opposition to the apartheid regime, he was also trying to communicate with people as people. This was something that he personally felt. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, um, he wasn't just trying to uh, to create political tirade. He was attempting to make music as a person. I just, I think there's something really elegant and really simple and very beautiful about that. And that's something I relate to. When I communicate with audiences, I want the love to come first and I want the love to bear the message, even if that message is combative, you know, under the surface. Beautiful. Does anyone have anything else to add? Or I'm sort of, like I said, I'm kind of going off script here. So I want, that, I want Alleluia to be saying, hey, where's he doing? Um, but, but I also want to welcome, you know, any comments you might have. <laughs> it's hard to know where to begin. Um, I guess I would just say that uh, music is a healing force. I think we all know that or else we wouldn't be here. Um, it's about care. <laughs> it's about um, mutual attunement. It's about how we listen to each other. And uh, you know, I think of it as a, a form of intimacy, basically. It's a way of being, not just being together, but being like pretty close together, like really communicating moment to moment with somebody and, and with not just with a fellow musician, but with the world. Um, and, you know, recently I, uh, <laughs> You know, there was this Twitter meme, what's not X, but sounds like X to you. So I did that with music. I said, what's, what's not music, but sounds like music to you. And most of the responses had something to do with love. Mm -hmm. that, you know, it was about like, for example, like the sound of my children in the next room, you know, or the sound of my partner breathing or things like that, you know, very intimate kinds of oral experiences. And I think that's, um, I mean, that, you know, when we kind of 
remind ourselves of things like that when we reground ourselves in that like simple truth about who and what we are then um the work is clear absolutely um definitely in the academy we're not explicit enough i think about loving people So, um, well, I'm going to go to, that's, I really want to dive into this more with all of you, but I think I'm going to move on to my prompt. Uh, thanks to, and to my prompt to Francis, Jen, and John now. Um, thanks, um, Erica, Carl, and Vijay. So, um, my question for... Francis, Jen, and John is, you know, you all have decades long careers. What keeps you motivated? After decades of creativity and working towards various political and artistic goals, what keeps the spirit of revolution alive for you? Or for that matter, love, right? Um, and what is your advice to younger Asian American artists in this time of social isolation and precarity? I wanted to, if we have time to go back to Eric, I want to hear her take on love yes. <laughs> after yeah, this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, love is like this screen, um, <laughs> John and Francis. Um, I think, you know, the words and kind of the, those meetings, all the, the dinners and the, um, all the hangs you know that we had together that's um it was really amazing and i'm amazed that it continues and um but i think um i think the the advice that they've always given me and that i continue to give to um you know my younger colleagues is is really to you know how you can contribute to um really you know, elevating uh, those around you. Um, and and I really didn't have that mentality uh, solid uh, when I moved to New York because it was such a scary thing. Um, and, you know, it was very different from the, the warmth of the Bay Area. And, um, and so I, I think even much like my focus now after being here, you know, I guess 20 years, um, you know, has been about creating models that are not here, um, you know, and, and, you know, we have voice collective was one uh, where we created a code of conduct um, for the performing arts and um, this mentorship initiative uh, really grew out of that conversation and elevating women, um, women of color, and especially Black women, um, and you know, making that happen. And also, women critics. Um, we have, we want to have a branch of not just mutual mentorship for musicians, but also mutual mentorship for music writers mm -hmm. and so we're building that with our editor-in-chief who is amazing journalist named Jordana Elizabeth who is a music writer one of the few black writers writing about jazz uh, and creative music you know who's who's uh, has quite a portfolio so you know we're working as a team to just figure out how can we get more uh, voices and and you know like exactly what Vijay said, like why is it that all the critics are mostly white male <laughs> uh, critics and you know, and how, how can we further that um, um, opportunity for, for, for others uh, mm -hmm. underrepresented. So anyway, I've talked enough, John and Francis. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in this particular moment, you know, it's like, you know, I'm sure it's kind of like you, Kevin. I mean, we're grading papers because um, I, I teach in Asian American Studies at San Francisco State. And 
Uh, I feel it a, a, a privilege to teach Asian American history. And uh, San Francisco State is, is 80% people of color, you know, and um, my classroom is 90% Asian Americans. So I have about 200 students and each semester we have about, I think it's 3,000 students in our classes. And, uh, and especially now, you know, with the uh, remote learning or whatever we're, we're calling it, um, you know, we have to uh, uh, We have to get through. And so a lot of it is uh, providing care, care, and that your professor cares for your creativity and what you're going to do with the world. Uh, John, take it away. <laughs> John. John. Yeah, you're muted, John. Unmute. Well, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm a proud alumni of uh, San Francisco State University. And I remember Francis, you were uh, the ensemble leader for the jazz group. <laughs> 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 As there, and it's you know, it, it's always such a beautiful thing to be in the room with you and receiving your mentorship and your encouragement. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Felez, can you repeat the prompt? Sure. Um, what keeps you motivated? Um, you know, after decades of creativity and working towards various political and artistic goals. What keeps the spirit of revolution, or like I said, of, or love alive for you? And what would your advice be for younger Asian American artists in this time of social isolation and precarity? Okay, boy, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, actually, I'll, I'll answer the first one because that's, that's simple. Uh, which actually most of you probably won't know the song um, because I think I represent, I'm the old, the eldest of this group. I won't tell you how old I am and you could quickly find that on Wikipedia anyway. Um, but uh, like in the lyrics of the Isley Brothers, uh, it's your thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's your thing, do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to sock it to, you know, so. <laughs> so that's actually just sort of a, yeah, the Isley Brothers of 1969, but that's like Asian Improv's arts mission statement is new directions in music by Asian Americans. So that could be new directions in experimental music, whatever that's called. It, it could be new directions in traditional music. Um, Okay, going to your previous question about what I've been doing. Uh, so I've been asked by a number of universities such as Brown University and Hamilton College to give presentations. And so some of the presentations sort of unpack my own uh, process of learning. Uh, see presentations such as uh, the sound struggle, music from the black liberation movement of the 1960s to the Asian American movement of the 1980s. Um, let's see, recently, Eddie Wong, who's an editor for East Wind, that's a, a e -zine, uh, eastwind, eastwindezine.com, um, asked me to write a, a piece about some recordings that I, that had an impact on me. Um, let's see, was, and that, that was entitled, let's see, what we could not say openly, we express through our music. And that's a quote from Duke Ellington. So, and, and it's in reference to like spirituals, such as you know, Wade in the Water, um, which was uh, a way to instruct, you know, Harry Tubman that uh, 
that that uh, runaways should should avoid the trail and go into the water so that the dog sniffing uh, slave catchers could not follow their their uh, trail. So um, let's see. Other presentations is how Black liberation music impacted me. Uh, traditions and transformation. Lost. Uh oh, he's frozen. Uh, <laughs> frozen in time. Visionary. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Can I come back in? <laughs> Francis, can you come? You, can you come? Oh, yeah. This so, <laughs> oh, well, you know, one of the You're things that again. keeps me going is uh, stories from John Gang. Um, John, you froze. Yeah, you okay. have to repeat your last <laughs> Oh. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, frozen to melted. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> wow. Well, well, actually yeah. I, I I would fall I said a lot of times like uh John and I keep each other going. So I know that every time like when it, the the song that was played earlier, the Mario Wood song, you know. So he didn't tell you the part about how he came to that because actually uh, one of his students uh, knew Mario. So, mm. and so uh, it's that, uh, um, I think, you know, Vijay was talking about that, that intimacy we have with the world and that there's a direct line from what happens in the world and what people want to do in the world through our, into our music. And so, um that's a lot of uh keeping that keeping ourselves open to that mm -hmm. it's really important yeah yeah are you with us john he's Maybe frozen not. again <laughs> um yeah i mean this all reminds me of um you know i just want to give a shout out to you know judy young right the chinese oh yeah mm -hmm. scholar who died recently, mm -hmm. and who actually put me, I think she was the one who initiatively put me in touch with you, Francis. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, she she was a connector, because mm -hmm. actually, um, she was the person, she he hired me to teach Asian American Studies in Santa Cruz, and Vinay was one of the, the students in my class, Vinay oh. Patel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I TA'd that class, and she was the one who encouraged me to write actually that first article of mine on Asian American jazz musicians. Uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, that's why I ended up talking with you and John and Fred. Um, oh, John. Okay. Yes. You know, I'm. I'm no. <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> free at last. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's see. I was talking about that's the about the spiritual. And anyway, so so yeah, I grew up in Palo Alto uh, during the 1960s, and at that time, Palo Alto was a quiet white middle class suburb. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, that's where Stanford is from, and and actually, the three of us, Jen, Francis, and I, have Stanford University connection. Crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, there's a book by Richard Powell. It was called uh, Black Art and Culture in the 21st Century. And in that book, uh, Richard Powell states that uh, Black revolutionary politics became a popular social phenomenon. And so during that time, there was a bookstore in Palo Alto called Camara Bookstore. And it carried a lot of books uh, about Black revolutionary politics and Black music, what I, what I would uh, call Black liberation music. And so um, I bought books written by Malcolm X, such as uh, By Any Means Necessary, where he recognizes the importance of Black music to Black liberation. And then uh, Malcolm X said that um, if Black people are given intellectual independence, they can create a society that hasn't been invented before, just like the black musician who improvises on something he hasn't heard yet. And relationship with that uh, 
that Malcolm recognized that. And then there were like six crucial books about black music written by black writers. So the first two, you know, we mentioned Murray Brock, Leroy, before that, his name was Leroy Jones. And so he wrote uh, Blues People and Black Music, which was a life uh, ch changing books for me. And um, let's see, after the assassination of Malcolm X, then Mary, uh, Leroy Jones rejected his slave name and changed it to Mary Baraka and became uh, the father of the Black Arts Movement and you know one of the important voices of the Black Liberation Movement. Now, uh, the, another side story to that is that uh, Mary Baraka was a leader in an organization called the League of Revolutionary Struggle, a, a uh, uh, people of color, working class organization, a revolutionary organization that Francis and I uh, were members of. And so that experience kind of deepened myself because, you know, growing up in Palo Alto, I, you could read these books and listen to these recordings, but it's it's from coming from kind of a, path, uh, a white perspective or passing as white. So you really we really had to develop relationships with black musicians, as well as the black community. And so living in Palo Alto, we had East Palo Alto, which, which was the black community. But uh, as being a uh, honorary white. Oh. I guess he said the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> so the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, maybe mm. in the meantime i was thinking there's a, another question maybe and this could be for everyone on the um on the panel the, a couple of questions oh go ahead john no okay <laughs> Um, oh, subbed in, right? What's <laughs> <laughs> up for John? <laughs> that was, was, I've been waiting for a year, 30 years for this to happen. Right. Just kidding. <laughs> Bringing everyone back on, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So, well, one thing that I've uh, been coming through, and I'm going to ask, these are some of the questions that are coming from the audience. Um, and something that I've been hearing too, right, especially in the last few minutes, is that there's been a lot of attention and a lot of um, homage given to black models. And, you know, um, rightly so. But I was wondering if there were also Asian or Asian American models that you were drawing from. Or, you know, there's this longer history, again, something that Francis and John first hit me to, you know, 20 years ago, of a long Asian American music in, in this country, right? Um, including big bands in the Japanese World War II internment camps, right? All sorts of ways in which Asian Americans, and I was wondering if there was uh, also, you're drawing from maybe some explicit models or maybe just, um, a sense of historical continuity um, with the Asian American musicians and music in, in this country. Anyone? That's. <laughs> so I know. May I that... chime in? Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I, I feel like um, this this merits saying, but especially in the Bay Area. Um, even before I began participating in any endeavors that um, under the auspices of Asian improv arts, I was familiar with Francis's work. I was familiar with John's work. Um, and I was familiar with the work of Louis Jordan, um, who was a member of United Front um, with Anthony Brown and Mark Izu. Um, the fact that this question has a, a variety of very complex answers and the fact that some of the participants in this panel our chief contributors to a tradition that I now participate in, I think is very significant. Um, because the, again, the history of um, Asian American culture and Asian American experimentation is very deep. But um, it also, this just goes to show just how important it is for people to step up um, on a one-to-one -one individual basis. Because frankly, if it weren't for a person like Francis, um, 
I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And that's very explicit, like specifically for France. If it is, if, if specifically Francis hadn't plucked me out of UC Berkeley with John Carlos Prey and put me on a gig um, at a movie theater somewhere, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> and I think that very much merits saying it's the, the nature of immediate community is very important in Asian American art. Yeah, absolutely. Any vital art scene. Um, yeah, if I can just chime in real quick, I, I think um, Carl's absolutely right. It's hard to talk about kind of the legacy of Asian American art making without uh, really acknowledging Francis and John's long running work and the influences that they've had on all of us. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think finding out about Asian improv arts and kind of finding their artists and the work that they'd done was life changing for me. Um, and uh, I remember, I think the first time I heard Anthony Brown's big bands behind barbed wires, like was such a, uh, it, it like blew my mind cause it hadn't, I hadn't seen anything like that until I saw that album and then you know, I went down the rabbit hole and found <laughs> other people and other albums. Um, and it did, yeah, I, th I think it reframed for me what the possibilities were for myself as an artist and the kind of things I could do. And um, and I think be, uh, just really helping me think of myself less as a, you know, an individual person making individualized art and more about uh, community and kind of making art within the context of a network of people um, that you're all trying to support. Um, so, yeah. Oh, John, oh, you're muted. I hear you, John. Unmute. <laughs> okay, I've, I've been going through the twilight zone, so I didn't hear what <laughs> the question was. <laughs> Oh, um, I was asking about, you know, hearing a lot of about African American models, and I was just wondering about, you know, Asian American models, um, given the long history that, that you know, you and Francis have, have turned me on to ages ago, um, and to speak to those models a little bit. Uh, maybe <clears throat> I'd like to say something. Uh, of course, first off, you know, thank you very much for all of you who, who um, said, you know, such really kind things about John and me, and uh, uh, very grateful for that. Uh, I think uh, one of the most important things, John and myself, is the fact that we faced our work in Chinatown. And uh, Chinatown's been around for 150 more or more years. And uh, if one of the issues of our time is cultural and erasure, um, Chinatown is really, we've been fighting that for, you know, more than 150 years. And uh, uh, it doesn't matter what the odds are. I think that's one of the that's one of the things that <laughs> I get from you know that lineage. You know, it's kind of like uh, uh, like the biggest strike in American history up to its point was these uh, was it three thousand Chinese railroad workers going on strike in the mountains. You know, and and they lost. But we still remember them, you know. And so I think the the thing in Chinatown, and you know, we're struggling today. You know, you know, we're blamed for the virus, you know, and uh, you know, even before everything blew open, Chinatown was, uh, you know, people were staying away from it. You know, as early as January, February. In fact, you know, um, Trump you know, attacked Pelosi for going to Chinatown. Right. So I think uh, one of the most the important models is that we we kind of emerge from um, that we're part of this really struggle to, it's that balance because on the one hand, 
we have to be, we're visible, hard to miss, right? At the same time, we have this real, we're just very stubborn. And we have, uh, um, there's a method to that stubbornness. It may not appear all the time, but we have a method to our stubbornness because we rely on each other. And we also uh, rely on other people. So there's just, uh, you know, you mentioned revolution, Kevin, you know. So there's a revolutionary tradition in Chinatown. And, you know, I think that uh, we could meet people. Uh, when I was coming through Chinatown, uh, we would meet people who were part of the general strike in 1934, you know. So just we have a just a history uh, and then we're carrying it through in the present because, hey, we still uh, we still are fighting and we're just not going to give up. And that's one of the that that's a model from our own experience. That comes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we am, and, and my my grandparents grew up in Chinatown. I'm, uh, I'm a descendant of a paper son, which is like a illegal alien or undocumented uh, uh, immigrant. Um, my my ancestor's true name is is Wu, and so uh, you know there was a Chinese Exclusion Act of 19 of 1882, which was the first um, legislation that banned immigrants solely on the basis of race. Well, I mean that's what it calls Chinese Exclusion Act. And so when the San Francisco earthquake occurred, the fire destroyed all the birth records, and suddenly San Francisco Chinese claimed they were Chinese Americans. And so, um, so if a Chinese father, a Chinese American father, had to travel to China, he would sell a slot to a Chinese immigrant, a Chinese who had no relationship, no family relationship in San Francisco. So uh, a, a, a San Francisco Chinese American father by the name of Jang would sell a slot to my family in Wu in China. And then my grandfather came over here in 1908, two years after the San Francisco earthquake. So uh, my, my grandmother, was a sewing woman. She worked 10 hours a day, six days a week. And she was involved in the uh, Ladies Garment Workers Union. And they went on a 105 day strike, you know, for, for higher pay and, and to be, uh, and for benefits. So yes, there's that history of persistence. Maybe I won't say stubbornness, but persistence and, uh, which I think I, 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 I took that from somebody. What was it? Oh yeah, Francis Wong, Persistent Solution. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there's a 1989 earthquake and the city had its, its focus on the Marin, you know, the white privilege area, but they, there was nothing about uh, Chinatown, any, mm -hmm. any concern about that. But we take care of our own. I mean, we, we have people like Norman Fong at the Chinatown Community Development Center, um, the, yeah, we're, we're survivors, and there's like Francis. There's a long history of that, and my family was in, was part of that that history that that built San Francisco. Great, oh man, that's I think a beautiful way for us to sort of start moving towards. Uh, I'll be passing the mic on to Hallelujah. Yes. Um, it's a, such a wonderful conversation with all of you. You have anything touched on all the things we could. Um, and it's just been a privilege for me to join in with all of you in this conversation. Uh, so thank you and, and thank all the attendees. And now I'll pass it on to Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Uh, what a powerful conversation amazing really it's it warms my heart too i didn't i didn't think this is this is what's going to happen and so it's just beautiful that we are able to come together just you know um and start a conversation that i think we've been wanting to have um all this time so thank you thank you carl bj 
John, Jan, Francis, Kevin, and the folks out there, all seven to six of you, um, for joining us. <laughs>